The Russian space program represents a remarkable example of extreme contrasts. From the time they ushered in the space age with the launch of the first satellite Sputnik in 1957, to the recent embarrassing breakdowns on board their aging Mir space station. The space program that once changed the very course of history, propelling the world into the greatest era of discovery and achievement ever known, has now spiraled down into a state of disarray and disrepair as a result of Russia's economic downfall. This is the story of the rise and fall of the once mighty Russian space program. The Russian space station Mir, a showcase example of Soviet superiority in space technology when constructed in 1986, was originally designed to be abandoned by 1991 and replaced with a newer space station. With the collapse of communism, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the ensuing economic depression in Russia, the space station was forced to remain in service many years beyond its designed lifespan. It is now falling apart at the seams, and several brushes with disaster have fanned serious doubts about the fitness of the space station specifically, as well as the Russian space program as a whole. These concerns are especially distressing to the United States, Canada, Europe, and Japan, who are paying the Russians hundreds of millions of dollars for access to the Mir in order to conduct a variety of science experiments as precursors to the building of the International Space Station. The United States and several other countries have formed an uneasy partnership with Russia to build the new space station by the early 21st century. The American space agency NASA is spearheading the design and construction of what will be the greatest cooperative undertaking in the history of humanity. The International Space Station was conceived during the height of the Cold War. In 1984, we committed to building it with the Western Bloc, and we were going to beat the Eastern Bloc. With the Berlin Wall coming down, President Clinton asked NASA to see if we could bring the Russians into the International Space Station as a partner. And since 1993, the Russians have become a partner in the International Space Station. With a grim state of the Russian economy, the partnership and participation by the Russians in the construction of the International Space Station was the result of reasons other than economic contribution or technological expertise. The Soviet Union has been brought into the uh, space station uh, development uh, primarily as a foreign aid project. Uh, for very real and uh, reasons, uh, people are concerned about keeping the uh, scientists and engineers of the Soviet Union employed in peaceful activities, rather than possibly uh, many of them going to the highest bidder uh, for uh, not so peaceful activities, particularly in the more terrorist-oriented states of the, of the world, where, the, uh, where they could contribute to the development of nuclear and biological and chemical weapons. The state of the Russian space program it, from our standards, is a shambles. And in some ways, you could look at it as a testimony to the incredible talent of the Russian uh, engineers, scientists, and cosmonauts to even have a space program, that they're able to support Mir. Obviously, the Americans are at the end of their rope for supporting the Mir. Uh, unfortunately, the Russians are approaching the end of the rope themselves, and what the future will hold for Mir and for the space station as a whole. The current condition of the Russian space program is a far cry from the days when the Soviet Union was at the forefront of rocket and space technology, and unlimited funding was at its disposal. The seeds of the Russian space program were planted in the closing days of World War II. At that time, the Germans had developed very advanced technology for building V-2 rockets at a site called Pinamunda. 
Before they could fully exploit their technological advantage, however, World War II ended in May of 1945. The Soviets were able to acquire many assembled V-2s, plus the necessary blueprints of more promising projects. Several German rocket technicians were brought to Moscow as well. It was from this rubble of the German rocket program that the foundations of the Soviet rocket research programs were built. By the mid-1950s, the Soviet Union's leader, Nikita Khrushchev, recognized the value of space propaganda as a tool of promoting communism. He secretly appointed a leading aviation designer, Sergei Korolev, to head the space program and dedicated a large portion of the country's resources in furtherance of one objective, to beat the Americans in space, thus proving the Soviet Union's superior technology. Korolev was ordered by Khrushchev to put a satellite into space at any cost, regardless of the risk or dangers. With all of the Soviet Union's manpower and resources at Korolev's disposal, he redesigned a military ICBM rocket, exchanging the nuclear payload for a satellite that he believed could be put into orbit. In a move that most experts around the world thought impossible, the Soviet Union became the first nation to successfully launch a satellite into Earth orbit on October 4, 1957. The satellite called Sputnik weighed in at over 100 kilograms. It carried a radio transmitter allowing it to be tracked and instruments designed to measure the density of the upper atmosphere. This event transformed the political, military and psychological climate around the world, serving to further heighten the divisions between democracy and communism during the early years of the Cold War. The hysteria and fear created by the success of Sputnik prompted President Eisenhower to address the American public in an attempt to reduce their anxiety. Eisenhower took a political beating over Sputnik because of a perception that he didn't respond effectively to the crisis. In fact, the Americans were experiencing great difficulty launching even a grapefruit-sized satellite into orbit. Khrushchev was clearly basking in the limelight, and he couldn't have been more accurate in his assessment that space was a perfect theater to compete with Western democratic countries and promote communist philosophies around the world. Khrushchev had successfully embarrassed the United States and showcased Soviet technological superiority. The environment was very threatening, uh, very challenging, and a sense that the space theater was going to be very, very important to the outcome or the results of uh, the Cold War. And it was viewed as a place where uh, the country of Russia at the time, the Soviet Union, could seek to enhance its uh, foreign policy image, its, its foreign policy image, uh, and uh, its perception around the world as a major power. It was seen as a real uh, area of competition. In the midst of numerous launch failures by the United States, the Soviets put yet another Sputnik in space, and the first one with a passenger, a dog named Laika. Laika survived several days in space before her oxygen supply was exhausted. The Soviets never publicized the fact that Laika was to die in orbit, as re-entry capability had yet to be developed. Finally, on January 31st, 1958, the Americans successfully put their first satellite in orbit designed by German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. However, Korolev upstaged his rival once again with the launching of a third Sputnik weighing over a ton, as well as sending two probes to photograph and explore the moon. The Soviets were way out in front in the race for space domination. Korolev and his space program were ordered to work so quickly to develop space technology that few safety measures could be taken in order to accomplish the next giant leap in space accomplishment, namely a manned space mission followed by an eventual lunar landing. Several jet test pilots were secretly chosen to train to be the first men in space and were called cosmonauts. At the time, no one outside the space program knew their names or backgrounds, and the cosmonauts themselves were not even permitted to disclose to their families what they did. <laughs> 
The Soviet leadership's attitude toward the pioneering cosmonauts and engineers, as well as the facilities and equipment, was that everything was expendable in the all-out effort to stay ahead of the Americans. As an example, recently revealed state archives indicate that in October 1960, a huge new booster rocket malfunctioned on the launch pad. Instead of taking safety precautions, the Kremlin ordered the launch director and engineers to fix the problem immediately and get the rocket launched that day. The launch director and over 165 men were inspecting the rocket when it suddenly blew up in a huge ball of fire, instantly killing everyone nearby. Rumors persist that this was actually an early manned launch attempt with a cosmonaut on board. Amazingly, this historic tragedy was never officially confirmed by the Soviet government. In addition, other uncovered Kremlin secrets indicate that as many as seven cosmonauts were killed in rocket explosions and other spaceflight attempts between 1960 and 1961. On April 12, 1961, the Soviets created a storm of worldwide excitement when they announced the successful orbit of the first man in space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Gagarin made a single orbit around the Earth during his flight. His spacecraft was totally manipulated by mission control on Earth. During the flight, Gagarin spent most of his time exploring the experience of weightlessness. Upon re-entry, he exited his capsule at about 3,000 meters and parachuted to safety, a fact not admitted by the Soviets until 1978. Although Gagarin's flight lasted only 108 minutes, it will forever remain one of humankind's greatest achievements. Recently released documents from the state archives at the Kremlin now indicate that Gagarin was not the first cosmonaut to return from space. Another cosmonaut, Vladimir Ilushin, the son of a famous Soviet aircraft designer, had previously returned from space alive, but in very bad shape. Apparently, the Soviet authorities felt they could not possibly present him to the world as a returning hero in such poor condition. As a result, the Soviet government removed all pictures taken of him and buried details of the flight. The heroic efforts of such a brave cosmonaut were unfortunately never to be publicly honored and were only recently acknowledged. As the Soviet leaders celebrated the successes of their space program, communists worldwide began to feel superior to the Americans. Shortly after Gagarin's flight, they made no secret of their conviction that the first man on the moon would be Soviet. Furthermore, the Soviets threatened to establish nuclear missile launching platforms in orbit around the Earth, as well as military bases on the moon. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev even instructed space program officials to prepare plans to paint the entire moon red so that every democratic nation on Earth would sleep under a red communist moon. There was a sense that America was playing catch up in space, catch up with the Soviet Union. So we had an environment of uh, competition uh, in space that was really part of a larger competition that was mostly military and political in nature. Uh, and uh, there was a general sense of threat and uh, unease and uncertainty about where this whole thing was going to go. In mid-1961, President John Kennedy, experiencing embarrassing setbacks in the American space program, sought counsel from his closest scientific advisors in order to discover what feat the Americans could beat the Soviets at in space.
Kennedy's advisors told him that the Soviets would certainly beat them at all space achievements in the short term. However, the big prize, landing a man on the moon by the close of the decade, could theoretically be accomplished by the Americans first. Kennedy then threw down the gauntlet on that goal, and the race to the moon began in earnest. By August 1961, the best America could manage were two suborbital flights, each lasting only 15 minutes. The Soviets stayed well ahead in space as cosmonaut German Titov orbited the Earth 17 times for a total flight time exceeding 25 hours. The Soviets again topped their achievements in August of 1962 when the flight of Vostok 3 with cosmonaut Andrei Nikolaev met briefly in space with Vostok 4 and cosmonaut Pavel Popovich. This so-called rendezvous in space further fueled speculation that the Soviets would surely be the first to land on the moon. In reality, neither spacecraft had the ability to change orbit to affect a proper rendezvous. Still, the resulting publicity created a tremendous fury over the accomplishment. We all knew they were very competent, they were very motivated, and that the resources of that country were totally dedicated to, uh, to accomplishing the goal, which, which was to beat us to the moon. So although we weren't, at least I was not aware of it on a day-to-day -day basis, we were certainly aware of the fact that they were competent and, and prepared to uh, do whatever it took to win. With Khrushchev in top political form and the Soviet Union riding high on the crest of their space accomplishments, the pressure was on to continue to produce more and more space firsts. In what many have called a publicity stunt designed to further embarrass the United States, the Soviets launched cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova to orbit the Earth for three days in June of 1963. During her flight, she rendezvoused with cosmonaut Valery Baikovsky. At that time, her flight lasted longer than all American astronauts' flight time combined. The city surrounding the Tereshkova flight eclipsed another dual rendezvous in space and the solo record set by Baikovsky when he spent four days and 81 revolutions in orbit, a record that still stands. The Soviet press was proclaiming that the first baby born in space would be a communist. The belief that the flight was a publicity stunt was fueled by the fact that Tereshkova appeared to be profoundly unqualified for the job as she was not a military jet test pilot, an engineer, or a scientist. By late 1963, President Kennedy, perhaps realizing the scope and cost of going to the moon, as well as recognizing the leadership position held by the Soviets, made a shocking offer. During a United Nations session, he proposed a joint collaborative moon effort in lieu of competing with each other in such an enormous venture. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. Khrushchev may have been just as surprised as the American public at such a conciliatory and friendly offer. However, the Soviet leaders interpreted Kennedy's speech as a clear sign of weakness and felt that perhaps the United States didn't have the stomach for a competition they realized they might not win. The race to the moon would continue. The Soviet space architects realized early on that a flight to the lunar surface would require at least three men. So Korolev designed and launched the first three-man capsule on October 12, 1964. 
The flight lasted for 16 orbits and was the first flight wherein the crew did not wear space suits. This was the most dangerous flight of all, especially since the crew had no protection in the case of an emergency. On March 18, 1965, at the height of the Cold War, the Soviets launched cosmonauts Pavel Boyaev and Alexei Leonov on a mission that would see the first man exit a spacecraft, adding to their already impressive list of space records. The main objective was to uh, come out into uh, outer space, and in this connection there was the task to test the airlock system, to test the space suit, and generally speaking to uh, find out how man would uh, act and react in uh, outer space to overstep the psychological barrier, which uh, we had no uh, knowledge of, uh, thank goodness. And this we did, and now I can say uh, with assurance that um, it is possible to live and to work in outer space. Leonov performed his spacewalk flawlessly, but encountered severe trouble upon attempting to re-enter the capsule. Unfortunately, the effects of outer space and weightlessness have not been taken into account in the design of his spacesuit, which ballooned out and made his return back into the spacecraft nearly impossible. Leonov and the Soviet space program narrowly escaped a tragic and embarrassing incident. Leonov's successful spacewalk put to rest all fears about working in space and whether men could walk on the moon. His flight, however, marked the end of the Soviet Union's overpowering dominance in space. The main reason for this decline was only recently revealed. The brilliant leader of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev, died suddenly in January 1966, leaving no one at the helm with either the design brilliance or political savvy to acquire funding and construct spacecraft needed for a moon landing effort. In addition, after Khrushchev's so-called retirement from Soviet politics in 1964, the leadership in the Kremlin under Leonid Brezhnev proved to be much less visionary and aggressive in space and became less confrontational with the Americans. The first sign of serious trouble in the Soviet space program came after a launch on April 27, 1967 of a test flight of the Soyuz 1 piloted by cosmonaut Sergei Komarov. The spacecraft lost control after a day in space as a result of several mechanical failures and re-entered the atmosphere like a fireball at 500 kilometers per hour. Komarov was killed instantly upon impact and this tragedy struck a blow to Soviet pride in their record-setting space program. Other problems arose when the giant booster rocket required to get a crew to the moon and back named N1 also proved to have severe design flaws. Without Korolev's leadership, the Soviet moon effort was doomed. Very uh, few people uh, remember that in parallel with American uh, Apollo program, Soviets uh, attempted uh, to have their own program. But this uh, Soviet program on uh, kind of uh, counterpart to American Apollo, it failed. It failed because uh, the large ro rocket, uh, Russian counterpart to Saturn V, exploded several times, even without getting chance to, to take off the launching site. The technological and monetary requirements needed to land a man on the moon finally overwhelmed the Soviets, forcing them to drop out of the space race. In July of 1969, the race to the moon officially came to an end with the Americans emerging as the victors when astronaut Neil Armstrong became the first human being to step onto the moon's surface. The moment American landed on the moon, 
and American astronaut uh, st uh, left his footprint, the Soviet government decided that the importance, significance of continuing these huge efforts, multi-billion dollar effort uh, in Soviet Union, just evaporated. And we decided, yes, silently we uh, uh, admitted that we lost uh, the race for the moon. The Soviets, uh, subsequent to the end of the Cold War, uh, not only uh, announced that they did have the objective of going to the moon, they even uh, uh, showed some of the hardware now that you can go over to a museum and see what they had prepared uh, uh, for, a, for a lunar landing. So they were, they were uh, prepared and uh, of course they, fought, they, they uh, fired, I shouldn't say fired, but they launched some uh, circumlunar flights of manned vehicles, so we knew darn well what, what they were trying to do. In parallel, Russians were developing a backup uh, scenario. They learned how to land uh, a small return rocket to the surface of Mars, oh, sorry, to the surface of Moon. And then, uh, in parallel with uh, Apollo sample return by uh, by men, by American astronauts. Russians had uh, much smaller quantity, but still scientifically important quantity of lunar soil brought back by these return uh, robotic uh, rockets uh, from the moon. For the Russian program, when we beat them to the moon, they took a different direction. And they began to think in terms of long-term missions. Uh, they began their exceptional work with space stations. But the, their program was an end in itself. There was never any um, pragmatic use for it other than defense. On June 7, 1971, three Soviet cosmonauts moved into their first space dwelling, the space station Salyut-1. For nearly 23 days, they engaged in meteorological observations, medical tests, and physical exercise. This near flawless mission came to a tragic end when an oxygen valve failed to close as the cosmonauts undocked from the Salyut, instantly killing the crew. On May 24, 1972, as the American Apollo moon missions were winding down, Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin signed an agreement to fly a joint Apollo-Soyuz mission and collaborate on a space venture scheduled for the summer of 1975, whereby spacecraft from both countries would dock together. This joint venture allowed the struggling Soviet space program to save face and gain invaluable experience from the Americans. For the Americans, the joint mission provided an opportunity to gain insight into the pioneering Soviet space program, which was often cloaked in secrecy. After three years of intensive planning and development, the two teams met the original target launch date of July 15, 1975. The mission began with the launch of the Soviet spacecraft Soyuz 19, followed seven and a half hours later by the launch of the American spacecraft Apollo 18. The Apollo spacecraft docked on the evening of July 17, 1975, as millions watched the two commanders float through the docking tunnel and shake hands. The cosmonauts and astronauts later exchanged visits to each other's spacecraft. Regardless of its technological benefits, the mission was of immense historical importance, proving that two former enemies could work together in space. Having demonstrated such cooperation, the possibility of an international space station became highly likely. We feel that is quite possible, we do indeed. And that will be indeed a very good meeting of Earthmen uh, in space, and we shall uh, climb aboard and uh, have a cup of tea together in a very friendly way. We have never 
objected to friendship uh, in uh, resolving our common task of uh, mastering outer space. And I always see Earthmen as all Earthmen as one big family and we must all work together like one family because we shall then go off to other worlds and there will be uh, representatives of many nations aboard. The Soviets realized that space stations represent the perfect stepping stones for traveling to other planets and have developed numerous space stations of various sizes. In 1986, the Soviets completed construction on their largest space station, Mir, which represented the ultimate showcase in space station technology. It was large and complex, with many modules for conducting different experiments. When the space station was launched, it was originally designed to last for only five years, then to be abandoned and allowed to burn up in the atmosphere when the orbit decayed. At the time, the Soviet space officials felt confident that they would build a newer generation of space stations with advanced technology by the end of Mir's lifespan in 1991. In an attempt to keep pace with the Americans, the Soviets copied the technology of the United States shuttle spacecraft with striking similarity and called their version Buran. Many Soviet space officials believed that this reusable spacecraft would perfectly complement and service their space stations. Unfortunately, even though the Soviets had achieved the technological capability for shuttle-type missions, the time had passed wherein their government could sustain the development and maintenance of an entirely new rocket system with the billions of rubles required. After a successful unmanned test flight in late 1988, the entire Buran effort was scrapped and never flown again. Even the blueprints themselves remain unaccounted for. Unfortunately, uh, Russia lost uh, this uh, launcher, this booster, uh, uh, which launched Buran, uh, it, because it was unable to uh, pay money to support uh, the war, to, to support even the infrastructure which was built to produce, to manufacture this launcher, and to keep a live launching site. While Soviet scientists worked with antiquated equipment and workers went unpaid for months on end, the political scene was becoming highly unstable. By the late 1980s, economic hardships began to seriously cripple their space program, which had become accustomed to a budget of billions. One of the driving factors in the space program was the Western Bloc competing with the Eastern Bloc to prove technical superiority. We showed our national will and our macho by having the strongest space program. We beat the Russians to the moon. We wanted to beat the Russians everywhere across the cosmos. But when the Berlin Wall came down, everything changed. At that time, scientists on both sides uh, had a rather naive idea that if there would be no Cold War, uh, we could come together and we will get all the money which were wasted for military budgets of uh, uh, both uh, superpowers. So now Cold War is over and uh, uh, we do not see such phenomena. We do not see peace dividends uh, for new, really outstanding space projects. The Russian space program was experiencing both economic difficulties and a split in public support. Russian efforts in outer space became a symbol for the old Soviet empire, a highly unpopular memory for many people of the former Soviet Union. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union and the collapse of communism, Russia and its space program are in a state of utter bankruptcy. The economy is for the most part unable to support the aging Mir space station. The Russians launched a supply ship to Mir and the cosmonauts were on board waiting for the ship. And when the ship actually docked with the Mir and the cosmonauts opened up the packages, 
they realized that a significant portion of the food was missing. And apparently what happened was that underpaid or unpaid workers at the uh, space station, or at the space complex, had actually pilfered the rations because they had not received pay for the work that they had been doing over the past six months to a year. The Mir has already far exceeded its design lifespan, and major breakdowns are now an almost daily occurrence. The main computers failed, the oxygen generators failed, alignment computers failed, air purifying filters failed, fires have occurred on board, and a cargo vessel crashed into one of the modules and solar panels. I think the biggest lesson is in the, uh, the perseverance aspect of it all. And I say that now because uh, Russia keeps pulling out tricks out of its hat on how to keep this thing flying. And uh, it's going to get steadily harder, I believe. But it'll be a progressive increase in difficulty to maintain the station. And that's, it will give everybody time to make that reasonable decision when to totally renovate it or to, to leave it. Perhaps the only reason why Russia maintains the aging Mir is that it is still a source of hundreds of millions of dollars in income from foreign space programs, renting time and space on board. Many space officials from various countries have warned of the dangers of keeping the station manned, but the Russians insist that it is still perfectly safe. The unmanned aspect of the Russian space program has mirrored its manned missions faring just as poorly. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, they were highly successful in sending several probes to Venus and Halley's Comet, bringing back tremendous amounts of invaluable data. Since then, however, nearly all unmanned probes have failed for a variety of reasons. Perhaps the last of the big unmanned exploration projects involving the Russians as a major partner was a very large and complex probe designed to orbit and land on Mars, originally called Mars 92. Its launch was delayed for several years due to a lack of funding. Germany finally financed the remainder of the project cost, and the probe was launched in November of 1996. Unfortunately, upon reaching low Earth orbit, the probe's fourth stage rocket booster failed to ignite, and the multi-million dollar probe re-entered the atmosphere and broke up over the Pacific Ocean. The probe's failure was a crushing blow and serious setback for the Russian space program and their effort to participate in the study of Mars. Most likely, this event ended their participation in Mars exploration altogether. This failure also marked the end of any further major unmanned probes scheduled to be constructed or launched by Russia in the future. Recently, the head of the Russian space program, Yuri Koptyov, told the government's cabinet that funding for space had dropped 80% since 1990. In addition, out of 20 countries active in space exploration and satellite launches, Russia ranked second to last in spending in 1996. Looting has also been reported by desperate, underpaid and overworked launch site workers at Baikonur. In addition, mission control engineers and scientists in Star City commonly work second and third jobs as taxi drivers and farmers because they haven't been paid by the space agency. There have been significant problems that have occurred, uh, primarily uh, regarding not paying the workers. Uh, certain factions of the, of the workers get paid a little bit, and other factions don't. And unfortunately, this tends to be along racial lines of uh, the racial divisions that are in the Baikonur area. Typically, the Russian workers will get paid when there is any money to be had, the Russian workers will get paid, and the indigenous population of Baikonur will not. And there have been riots that have occurred. Uh, buildings have been burned down, people have been killed. As a last resort, 
the Russians have sold off parts from its rocket manufacturing factories and entered into partnerships with American corporations. One of the great economic opportunities that some of the American aerospace companies have taken advantage of is funding the Russian rocket companies, the Russian aerospace companies making these boosters, providing them with a steady supply of capital so that they can actually stay, they can actually have a budget, that they can actually get parts, that they can actually pay their workers. It's a remarkable opportunity for the, the aerospace companies that have chosen to fund the Russian companies because these, now, these American companies now have access to the best boosters in the world. Even these efforts are insufficient to keep the Russian space program afloat as its facilities are deteriorating rapidly. Amidst the problems facing the Russians and their space program, it was still felt that bringing them into a partnership in the design and construction of the new International Space Station was appropriate, given the Russians' experience. Well, I think the storyline is that the human race is starting to emerge as an entity rather than as nations. I mean, in, in, a, in a truly sort of holistic sense. And the details of which nation is doing what will be lost, I think, in history. It will be seen that it's much more human. I think if you went back to the Gagarin time, it will be noticed always that it was Russia that did that. And when you go back to the lunar landing, it will be noticed that America did that. But I think as we move forward, you're seeing the world becoming more international. In 1993, the Russians joined the United States and its international partners in this venture. At that time, they all laid out a bold three-phase approach to progressively move towards that goal with the sharing and exchange of hardware, knowledge, and expertise. The first phase of this international cooperation began in February 1994, when cosmonaut Sergei Krikalov became the first Russian to fly in the American shuttle spacecraft. This mission established the working relationship necessary for future cooperative flights. In March 1995, U.S. astronaut Dr. Norman Thagard became the first American to fly in a Russian spacecraft and moved to a three and a half month stay aboard the Mir. Since then, Numerous missions with both Russians and Americans have been flown, and the ever-increasing cooperation and collaboration between the two nations as a part of the new space station construction. Unfortunately, the joint space station venture between the United States and Russia was nearly derailed on a number of occasions. Russia threatened to back out because it could not support its mere station and the new project. The United States ended up assisting the Russian space program and saving the joint effort with the influx of millions of dollars. Still, the Russians continue to prove a difficult partner. Several delays in the construction of the International Space Station have occurred as a result of Russia not being able or willing to perform their agreed upon tasks. Right now, it appears that uh... Uh, those dollars that are being sent to the former Soviet Union, namely ru primarily Russia, uh, to uh, ensure their participation in the space station uh, may have been largely wasted because we still do not have a product. Uh, we have now looking at it, uh, probably at least another year's delay in the construction of the station as a result of, this, of the Russia not being able to perform or not being willing to perform their uh, agreed to task. And so uh, that's the kind of thing you get into when you make your space program primarily an instrument of the State Department. Uh, you, uh, your space program, if you're going to have a federal governmental space program, it should be in and of itself for its own purposes. Another reason for an international partnership with the space station was to spread the cost of launches and the building of the station across many countries. The issue of continued Russian participation, however, is still questioned. The cost sharing was one of the original justifications for bringing Russia uh, and other nations into it. But in the case of Russia, it, it has not worked out. In fact, uh, Russia's participation is costing us uh, much more money now uh, 
than we uh, might have saved uh, had they even performed well. Uh, and and it's, just a different, it's just a different game. The Russians were not prepared uh, politically or, uh, or technologically or uh, uh, economically in order uh, to participate in the space station program. And we, we knew that, uh, and many people predicted that this is what was going to happen, and indeed their predictions have come true. Some of the pains that you're seeing in the, in the press and the, some of the, uh, the friction that apparently comes out between different parties in these joint space ventures that come out, I think they're just signs of the future. We're going to see this continuously. I think back in the time of Gagarin leading up to uh, Neil Armstrong putting the first foot on the moon, that time was driven much more by antagonism. Whereas now it's, it is, it's driven a little by competition, but as much by co cooperation and the desire and the need for it as anything else. Throughout the early years of space exploration, the Soviet-Russian space program continually dazzled the world with an impressive array of space firsts as they were cheered by millions for their achievements. After the death of Korolyov and shackled by the oppressive hands of their communist leaders, Russian scientists never really moved beyond the early triumphs of their space predecessors. Is the program on the verge of extinction of collapse? Probably is from our perspective, but from the Russian perspective, they will probably be able to keep it going for enough years until somehow enough capital is infused into the country, whether that be from American aerospace companies uh, supporting the Russian aerospace companies in the making of their boosters, or whether that be from another means. That remains to be seen. One of the things I should say that has never ceased to amaze me is Every time we think something has really gone wrong in the Russian program, really bad, it hasn't. And uh, we've had many, many false alarms, many scares about things being the end on board the Mir. And indeed, the, the Mir is an extraordinary spacecraft because it's lived long beyond its design lifetime. But the Russians have incredible ingenuity and resilience in maintaining that space station in a working order. Perhaps the greatest lesson learned from Russia's spectacular early years in space and their dramatic fall in prominence is that discovery and achievement must be coupled with fiscal responsibility and commercial viability. This pragmatic approach must be considered if continued space exploration and future missions are to thrive and allow space programs worldwide to exist into the next millennium. <laughs>